Hello, folks. Uh, my name is Tin, and it might be a bit, a bit of the surprise for you who have seen the schedule. Uh, this talk was originally supposed to be given by my colleague Stanislav, but he has called in sick, so I'll be replacing him. The talks are not exactly the same, but the gist is very similar, so if you read his abstract, it's pretty close. So let's get on with it. Uh, I'm going to talk about refactoring, about changing your legacy code to meet some modern standards. I'm going to talk about why, what's the point, how to do it, and how to do it well. I'm also going to touch onto the topic of throwing it all away. Is there any point in keeping that old code when you can rewrite something much nicer? But first, some introductions. I am Tin, I'm a team lead at Kiwi.com leading the booking backend team. It's web development. Uh, I love software architecture. I enjoy solving problems in a way that makes sense in delaying decisions, in trying to make as much with as little information as that, that I have. I have some experience working in Python open source, if some of you have heard of edX. And uh, right now, I'm a developer at Kiwi. So, I've seen a lot of troubled older code that needs developing, that needs working on, and that needs uh, people to give it some love. And uh, I'm going to be sharing the experiences of this today. So yeah, what's the point? We are going to be learning how to read from older code, how to see what's there. We're also going to be respecting what's called Chesterton's fence. It's a principle mainly used by Wikipedia, where you're not supposed to alter anything you don't understand. Because if somebody put it there, there's probably a reason why nobody removed it yet. We're going to push for incremental changes. We're going to focus on modernizing things, not reinventing them. And I'm going to mention tests, naturally, because a lot of legacy code is known as a code that's almost not tested at all. So we're going to talk about how to make that happen. So yeah, this is a quite a bit general topic. Some examples will be provided and they'll be specific. And we're going to cross it in some three chapters, so to say. We're starting with easy wins, which may be interesting for majority of you. These are tools and uh, approaches that can be done today to instantly make your code base better. We're going to cover some patterns and anti-patterns, some things that you may see and uh, encounter often and how to change them. And then we're going to talk some philosophy, some practices we use in our work structure for our company, which may be useful for those of you who work in smaller companies or startups that still haven't developed all this methodology. So yeah, easy wins. As I mentioned, they're easy. They're a thing you can do in a day. They are plugins, libraries, utility software, some scripts, things you can run today to make your working life easier instantly. They are great, but they usually don't fix the root cause of why legacy code is legacy code. We're going to go through them anyways because they are just great stuff to use. So we use a lot of automated tools to assure our code quality because tools are cool. You set up a script, you make a decision, and that decision saves you so much time. How many of you do code reviews at your companies? Could you raise some hands? Ah, that's great, almost everyone. So, code reviews can be a pain, especially if things are not automated. Your colleagues may be nitpicky, you may have problems, you may argue about spaces or tabs, about indentation styles, about where to place that bracket, and things like this waste our time. They waste a lot of time. That's why we try to make all of these rules, and we try to make them all automated. So you press a key binding, uh, key binding and uh, everything is automatically formatted. We try to avoid any arguments that are trivial, so code reviews can focus on the actual code and not uh, ego fights. So yeah, for this we use uh, linters, Two most famous linters are PyLint and uh, MyPy. MyPy is more of a typing 
software, but they're similar. They run the code to check if it follows these rules. It is, they are full of industry practice, so you don't have to double guess most of it. And uh, many companies use this. How many of you use Pilot weekly? Majority. And how many of you do automate it, so you don't have to run it yourself? Well, that's a decent number, around a half. So the rest of you, you should automate it. It's a great thing to have automatically to check your code before it enters the master branch, before it gets shared to your colleagues. If it's, automated, if it's not automated, people will skip it. There will be reasons for not using it, and it's not going to be good. Uh, MyPy checks uh, that your code annotation, your typing annotations, I've seen a talk yesterday that mentioned these. Uh, it checks if they follow what's uh, written in the code, how, how your code works. So MyPy will check that your code follows the types you've set down. So it's not just an annotation in your EDE, it will have to be practically viable as well. And it's great because it's an opt-in thing. It's a thing you use for a single function to run it, to have that uh, functionality just for the function itself. That's great, that's great, because if you have a large code base, if you have a messy code base, you know that the majority of your code cannot be typed easily. But you start, you start with one, two, three functions, and as you grow your code base, as you cover more and more, these practices rub off onto more code, and eventually you achieve typing, at least in over half of your code base. And it's easy to get it rolling. You don't have to stop, drop everything, and start focusing just on typing. You can develop features as usual while just sprinkling a little bit of typing here and there. So yeah, Black. How many of you use Black? I talked about Black on a lightning talk in a PyCon UK, and I was in love then. I'm still in love. It's a code style formatter that doesn't let you configure it. This sounds like a bad idea for you who didn't see it, right? You cannot configure anything. But that's what makes it great. There are no arguments. It's how it is. They accepted a lot of feedback from the community. They set it up, and it works. And a great thing is that it checks the Python AST to make sure that the code runs exactly the same. It compiles it in a type of speaking to make sure that you didn't make any syntactical changes by formatting your code. That's invaluable. So yeah, then there's Koala. Koala is uh, some kind of a framework that runs many tools in a very modular framework basis. This is maybe the most advanced of these tools, and uh, it's a bit too complex to cover in a single talk, and you can check it if you want. It also runs fixers, so a lot of issues that the other tools just show you, Koala offers automatic fixing for. It's a pretty awesome tool. So yeah, this is a simple example of uh, some function that we ran through the automatic code uh, inspection, and it cleans up a whole mess into a very nice documented, if useless, function. And the uh, thing is, the things that you cannot automate the change of, you can block the developer from releasing code if it doesn't pass the checks. That's great. That's something you can do in a week, and then every developer will have to check up what they're doing, how they're doing their code, and they will not be able to take the lazy shortcuts. So yeah, these tools make discussions. These tools make you not have to tell your colleagues to clean up their code. They are automatically blocked, and they will have every change matter. It's a great win because you think about real problems. You think about things that uh, matter, logic and code quality, and not about line breaks and other somewhat nonsensical things. It's an easy bump. It will not fix your code base. Let's be real about these things. It's not going to be a cure for all the problems you've been having but it will help you focus on them more. So yeah, what will help you more is introducing some better patterns and discovering what are the anti-patterns in your code base. So when you have a code 
when you have code that's hard to use, it's usually because that code is very surprising. That code does things you cannot expect it to. That's what people call with a, that people call out with the principle of least astonishment. Basically, if your code base astonishes you every hour, you're going to have a very slow pace at making changes, at generating updates. Because every time you think something is going to work, it breaks. And vice versa, it's e equally bad if you think that something broken shouldn't work and it actually does. That's sometimes even a bigger problem. So yeah, legacy code often astonishes people. How many of you have heard of historical reasons when you've asked about a bad change? Yep, it's a common thing. It's a common thing that somebody can say, oh, we did it this way, it's very bad, but we had a really good reason back then. And this may work short term, but the more of these you have, the slower you are at developing, the slower you are at getting changes out, and there's more opportunity for mistakes to happen, for outages, crashes, bugs, for things to break. And we don't want our code to break. So yeah, you can detect these by choosing for code smells. Those are symptoms of some bad code, of some bad architectural decisions. They, have, they are showing you where code has been neglected, where somebody was inconsistent, things that shouldn't be there. And they're usually because of these reasons, because of some deadline of a co cost cutting. Somebody was supposed to have a week, but they got, it got released after two days. Prototyping, things like that. There are, there are plenty of reasons why somebody may hurry up a developer who will then do a shanty job of his uh, code. So yeah, easy ones are super easy to fix. It's a couple lines of code. It's somebody not following your formatting logic, not using list comprehension properly, things like that. They, are, they don't really have scope. They can be fixed in one afternoon by an eager person. Then you have the medium ones, the hefty ones, which are some mistakes that are patterns, or anti-patterns as it may be, in your code base. These are mistakes that people repeat because they see them all around, they copy-paste code. They figure out if they did it this way, I should do it as well. These mistakes respawn. They happen all over and uh, people start reusing them often. And they're some of the worst problems. <coughs> then you have the hard code smells, the things that everybody notices and everybody knows it's wrong, but you really cannot remove it. It's bad choices of framework. It's bad choices of uh, how you structure your entire code base. It's uh, very bad decisions that were made at the start of a project. And this is the usual, the usual reason to rewrite everything. And sometimes that may be the only cure, but you can also work around most of these if you have enough time and determination. So yeah, here are some examples from our own code base at Kiwi. Uh, we have an easy one where people were adding airlines and adding them currencies, and these currencies started repeating. This is maybe trivialized a bit, but we had something very similar where you had uh, dozens of elifs all replaceable by a single dictionary. And we replaced them and it ended up saving us like 50 lines of code for just a simple dictionary lookup. Then we had uh, a bit more medium, a bit more dangerous pattern where people would just use uh, a dictionary as a general dump of all information. They would add uh, data and return data as a dictionary and every part of this function would just modify that dictionary in place. It was a nightmare until we managed to get rid of it, at least most of it. And that's a, that's a problem, that's a big anti-pattern. And the hardest one in knowledge that I had know is uh, the ORM. We, we used to work with uh, raw SQL queries and we used those queries directly. We didn't actually type our database, we just used a dictionary that was returned from our SQL query and then did work on it. That's a bad idea, trademark. 
Basically, it meant that we didn't have typing anywhere and that our database changes would break all of our code without us even knowing. We changed that by ad adapting SQL Alchemy and creating an object layer where we typed everything we got from the database with those objects representing our changes. It helped, we didn't adapt a very strong framework because we tried not to, we tried to keep to lightweight frameworks and modules to keep changing easier, but adding SQL Alchemy saved us a lot of time. And uh, to work with these, to know where you need to make changes and what's a good thing to change, a uh, great tool is SonarCube. It's a static analyzer that you can install, that you can subscribe to, uh, and uh, it analyzes your code base through your Git, uh, of Git uh, repository of choice, and it analyzes bugs, code smells, it adds security oversights that it knows for different languages, in this case Python, it checks your test coverage, trends, who adds code that breaks tests, who adds code that's good, and it attracts that comments and docs are made everywhere. And what's great, it does it in your source management tool. For example, in GitLab, it directly comments on your very merge request telling you that your method doesn't work. Well, it doesn't follow standards. And to make it even greater, each of these identifiers have this little blue book. You click and get a full explanation of why is this a bad change, why is this a good change. So it's a great thing to provide for junior programmers because then they know, okay, we're not forcing our opinion, we have a whole lot of reasoning for any restrictions we make. So, with uh, these tools that will show you where you're making issues in your code, you can recognize some anti-patterns that go throughout your code base. Wherever people work in a team, there's always going to be people who are easily impressed, who follow a direction that's already there and they don't, they don't question it too much. It's what happens when your code grows organically, when you get changes from people who are just enjoying their work. They're not thinking too far into the future. They're copy-paste coding often. And uh, it's a normal thing in smaller companies. It happens everywhere. So for us, one of these were the magical methods, so to call them, which were just the antithesis of functional programming, where you would get a lot of things happening on a very simple function. You would never know that the function edits dictionaries that you didn't even pass to it. It's an uh, implemented side effect that was later replaced by better object-oriented approach by making stricter data access layers so you wouldn't be able to change anything in any function. But we had a lot of problems as developers would see this, would see that uh, a function is able to change anything and they would start doing it as well. It makes things easy when you can just edit a global variable but it doesn't make them very constructive. And we had a very unique problem, I would say, that we had functions with dozens of decorators. That's very, I've never heard of anybody else having that problem, and if you had uh, a code base where you would use over six or seven decorators, come talk to me to the stand, I would like to hear your experiences. But generally, decorators should be explicit and they shouldn't replace method calls if they don't need to. And for us, we had these huge chains and people would see that, they would see, oh, decorators are a cool thing and they would write their own. They would also add them. And we had problems with that. We had a lot of problems teaching people that no, decorators aren't the greatest thing ever. So yeah, these things were anti-patterns that were spreading organically because people would see it, think it's a cool thing, they didn't know better, they made problems. We needed to f push some better patterns to have a uh, newer code that would succeed, that would flourish better because we separated from these older, messier structures. We did that by creating some kind of an interface 
not the Java or other hardcore object-oriented programming uh, interfaces. It was more a bit of an abstract module that we put all the interfacing code in. We tried to hide mistakes of yesterday so people would see, okay, we're hiding this actively because it's a bad pattern. Let's not do it again. So yeah, we would find the common usages of a pattern and then replace it with something that would point out it's a bad idea and it should be done differently. We would try to find that use case it's trying to solve and create a replacement that we would promote there. And in the edge case, we would re-implement so people would see, okay, that's how it's supposed to be done. We also created these facades where as we add a smarter function, a smarter object, it doesn't always interface with the rest of the stuff easy. It doesn't go easy to the uh, rest of the code. So we would create some mocking uh, objects that would hide uh, all the complex functionality and boil it down to a single function. So instead of a user that you can add a password, that you can add a username, change, etc. for, we would just create a function, change the user's password, and it would instantiate the user object and explicitly say, this is how you do it when you can. So yeah, we also inverted this principle as well where we try to hide that old code in a better uh, bubble of functionality. You use an interface that uh, is class-based. In the behind it, you actually use all the global logic, but you try to make it explicit that this is not supposed to be. You create a contract that people who work on this project will try to follow. So yeah. It's almost never pretty after you grow and after that hacky project of five people ends up being a corporation with 200. But you cannot really throw it away because it's how, it's how it works. It's what brings you money or success or research or however you use it. And you cannot really throw it away because it would be a huge roadblock. So you try to create this bubble of cleaner code, try to interface around it and try to get everything to be explicit. So if you're going to take shortcuts, you make them very explicit and you teach people this is not the way, but we have to use it. So yeah, with this we've covered the, the patterns, anti-patterns, and some tools. But most important of it all is to try to instruct your peers to follow these rules, to try to enforce them somehow. Basically, we can talk about good practices as much as we want. If somebody ignores these rules, they are not going to follow them. And for that, you need to get people to think a bit out of the box. You need to push people to realize that they need to change themselves as well. So yeah, uh, you need to approach these problems slowly. You cannot throw it all away because people will get thrown off. Incremental steps help you adapt with time. When you make a change, leave it a week, give it a week so people can figure it out, read through the code, and realize, okay, this is a great idea. These incremental steps will let everybody adapt and work with your code. Enforce code reviews. They are a greatest thing you can have. Require tools to pass and don't allow anybody to add code that wasn't reviewed. So try to bake in protections against this and split the responsibility. Don't say that a code review is just there. If uh, something breaks, require the reviewer to assume some responsibility and help fix it as well, because they didn't notice breaking. This way you get people to actually try to cooperate and not just do it for practice. And yeah, it will help you reduce the bus factor of your company if all code needs to be covered by at least two people. So. Keep it blameless as well. Don't blame people for not knowing things, for not uh, realizing things. When you review, make it impersonal and go through the tier system. Keep people on the track to look over the overall scope to figure out, is this working? Does it fit our system? And is the code clean? By following these three steps, you keep reviews manageable in length and people will do them happily when they don't know that they don't have to rewrite everything for several times. 
uh, try to educate your people. Make sure that your devs understand why, how and why are we doing this. Focus on documentation. I don't, probably don't need to tell you about this, but uh, documenting why is the bad reason there is also useful. Why is the bad there? Because then people will understand that somebody else had the same logic and that it ended up being not that great. Explain it. Explain how things were and how things should be so everybody can feel a part of the process. There's no easy win here. You cannot make your code great overnight. It increases slowly, and tooling doesn't replace good engineering. That's why we, I called all those tools easy wins, quick wins. They are great. They will help you, but they will not suddenly make your product work better. It's just a step there. Uh, and also manage expectations. Teach people that code is written to be replaced. There's not, it's not good if there's too much ego in programming because there's always improvements and they're always there. And eventually you want to have all your code replaceable overnight so it doesn't depend too much on each other, so it doesn't depend too much on other implementations. Separation of principles pretty much, but a lot of people don't realize that. And uh, yeah, explain people that code depth is real depth, that having bad code will eventually cause things to crash, to stop, and that mistakes will happen more and more. It's a problem sometimes for you who have a lot of managers or a strict management to explain why, why do we really need to ch make these changes? Why do we really need to update things? And uh, explain them in simple time. It will always take time to work around a bad code base. Basically, convince them that mistakes cause lo losses and that code depth is to blame and not the developer. Developers aren't all powerful, and in a workday, there's only so much surprises you can, you can have from your code. So yeah, basically, a low-quality code is a symptom. It's a thing that got, happened because of bad decisions, of bad causes, but you cannot fix it overnight. Go step by step. And try to keep it consistent. Try to keep uh, it a philosophy of the company and not just your own one day inspiration. There's no winning this it, overnight. It takes a lot of policy changes and a lot of uh, reviews and introspections. So yeah, when you have old code, it tells a story. There's a reason why most of those decisions were made. That story needs to become better. It needs to modernize. It doesn't need to be rewritten. First, grab the easy boosts, add some tooling, make it obvious that people want to make improvements, try to rewrite the failures you have in bubbles one by one, isolating them using any type of abstraction you want, some facades, and then maintain quality going forward. Teach your people how it works and why it works so, and uh, maintain that quality. So, thank you for your attention. I'm up for any questions, if there's a quick question or two. And I'll be at the Kiwi stand afterwards if you want to ask a question in private. So, anyone? Thank you, Tim. I have a question there. Yeah. Uh, hello. So, one question about automation of uh, PyLint, MyPy. I know that uh, from my trades, uh, you can add to git hooks running PyLint by default. How would you did the automation stuff for your code before pushing your code to your we have the We have the hooks, git hooks added there and uh, part of our repo, so everybody pulling gets those files as well. And we also have a continuous integration, so GitLab, the server, runs our code checking tools and doesn't allow you to merge if they are, aren't green. Okay, thank you. No problem. Hi, uh, thanks for your speech. Um, I have a question. I had a manager once, a tough one, and I was trying to explain to him that we need to uh, make some refactoring in our code base, a uh, huge refactoring because it's going out of uh, like being very old uh, fashioned, old style, and 
have having many mistakes. And uh, yeah, uh, he always uh, asked me um, why, and I said the same uh, as you, time. But then he said he was asking uh, for uh, hard numbers, yeah? and I was wasn't able to uh, estimate that numbers. And what could you advise in that situation? I would advise that you create a small proof of concept, an MVP with like smarter technology and track the time. It would probably not take that long as adding the changes to the existing product and show him, okay, I made this MVP in three hours, I will need two weeks for this functionality. Maybe the numbers will not be as correct as the reality, but the, the scale itself will be completely different. At least we found it to be. Okay, thank you. Thank Wrong. you again. We have, that's all the time we have. Thank you.